perhaps if this lecture had been given before the election. <laughs> Never mind. Okay. <clears throat> um, I want to share with you that uh, just a couple of days ago, my father-in-law was visiting, and uh, he is a teacher, and he uh, loves to gather my children and share some different thoughts with them. And so he was, he was giving them some reflections upon charitable actions. And he wanted to illustrate that. And so he, he said to the children, what would you do if you're walking down the road and you come upon someone unclothed? Well, my seven-year-old Julianne immediately said, oh, I'd turn the other direction. <laughs> Not the example, not, probably not the answer that he was looking for. I'm not sure whether that's a sign that I'm doing something right or doing something wrong in my um, raising of my children. But great moments of, like that are what teachers especially enjoy. I do have a challenging topic uh, here this evening, and I'm not sure what you're expecting and whether what I'm going to do is what you're expecting. But I am going to focus on a few basic principles that are present in this amazing philosopher Plato that I think will make all the difference in the world for our understanding of politics. At the end of considering those principles, we may well be tempted to think, oh my, if that's true, then what in the world are we going to do now? Well, the good news is I think that we'll be able to offer some reflections as to what we might be able to do now, what we can do in view of these truths that will make a difference. And I'll start by saying this, always remember, we are called to be faithful, not necessarily successful. We are called to be faithful not necessarily successful. And that, for sure, we can do. There are a few more handouts in the back. I'm actually going to refer rather often to the handout. If you don't have a handout, if you could raise your hand, perhaps um, we could uh, get a little help passing a few more rounds. And then if we run out, then perhaps we could do a little bit of sharing. I want to go first right for the heart of the matter, I'm just going to linger for a moment here while those are being passed out. The order of the day is I'm going to begin by kind of going for the heart of the matter, the main insights that Plato shares with us. Then we're going to look at some basic political principles in Plato. We're going to look at his treatment of different regimes and how he characterizes them. And then we'll wrap up with some practical suggestions for what we might do in view of these principles. The only true source of communion, of true peace among human persons, is to be striving together towards virtue. The only true source, again, of peace, of real communion, of real community, of real connection between human persons is when they are striving together towards the true human good, which is the life of virtue. For the true end, the true goal, is what gives unity. It gives unity by giving the proper order. When the true goal, when the true end is put first, then everything is in its place. And the soul has order, harmony, and peace. And there can be order, harmony, and peace between human persons when what is first is but put first. But ladies and gentlemen, if what is first is not put first, then things are coming 
apart, even if they have not yet completely come apart. Again, I say, if what is truly first is not put first, if the true end, if what is most important is not put where it is supposed to be as the source of order for all of life, then everything is coming apart even if it has not yet completely come apart. You can see this in all aspects of life. Tonight, our focus is going to be on political society. But just as an example, consider a marriage, a friendship, a school. If what is first is not put first, then it's coming apart. And sometimes things take a while to come apart. But when they finally do, you realize they've been coming apart for a long time. May I be bold and say we might find ourselves in the position of realizing our society is coming apart. Indeed, it's probably been coming apart for a while. And there comes a point where it's quite apart. Plato is the master of seeing what must be first and what happens when what must be first is not put first. Would you be so kind as to look at your handout? If you don't have it, I'm going to read it out loud in any case. But our, on our first page, we have some basic political principles from Plato's Republic. Now here you're going to realize political here is going to be used in a, in a general way. I mean, we're not going to hear about you know, voting and campaigning here when we talk about political principles. We're at, a, we're at a deeper level, a higher level. It has implications for the whole thing. This is a beautiful thing about philosophy. When you go for the deeper principles, it has implications for everything, though it at times can be a little bit harder to understand. Point one. The greatest human good is to be found in the polis's good, I'm using a Greek word there which I define right under that. The greatest human good is to be found in the polis's good. In other words, human happiness is primarily achieved in the communal flourishing of a good polis. Polis, Plato's name for what we call a civil society or a political community. This was, this was a central insight of the great Greek philosophers. When they consider human flourishing, what human happiness looks like, they realized it is such a noble, profound, and complex thing that the best instance of it is not just to see an individual flourishing, happy person, but in fact, it's an entire community that flourishes together. That is human fulfillment in the fuller sense. Bear in mind now, when we're looking at Plato, there isn't divine revelation. There wouldn't be a notion of church or the city of God, but I'll just say in passing here, the beautiful thing here is these fundamental principles can be applied and expanded to the theological realm also, but we're putting our focus on what philosophy can see here. So the greatest human good. This isn't to say, as opposed to supernaturally, supernatural considerations of divine revelation are not part of what Plato's looking at. So to him, the human society, the polis, is the greatest community that there is. And of course, naturally, that's, that's true. Point two. What constitutes the common good of the polis is essentially the same in kind as what constitutes the perfection of the individual. Thus, as virtue is the perfection of the individual, virtuous life together is the common good of the polis. Here, here is perhaps the most foundational principle 
Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, they, they all agree on us. If you want to understand the city, you have to see that in a sense the city is man, is the human person writ large. So we just have to think about the city in the same way that you think about individuals. And so the flourishing of the whole community will be the same in kind. Indeed, it will be even greater. But it will be fundamentally the same in kind as it is in individuals. So if the real flourishing of a human person, the real happiness of a human person is in the virtues, then likewise, that is fundamentally what political society, too, is most of all about. Was the real human flourishing will look like being virtuous together as a whole. One thing that we can see from this right off the bat is politics is a profoundly moral affair for these thinkers. Anyone who would separate politics from the realm of morality and character is not putting what is first, first. For the main assertion about human nature is that human fulfillment and happiness most of all consists in living virtuously. And if that's the case as regards an individual, then that is the case as regards a city. It matters not how tall the buildings, how beautiful the landscape, how large the gross national product is. If the main characteristic of the society is not that virtue is being lived not just by individuals, but in a communally recognized way. Ladies and gentlemen, I present for your consideration, this is actually difficult for us to picture because I present to you the challenge that the majority of us have never seen it. But human flourishing at a societal level can be a, yea, should be a shockingly beautiful thing. What, what does it even look like to have virtue lived together communally? How, how do we even come up with an example? Let me just throw a couple things that we might just picture for a moment. Just picture when education is done with a communal conviction that the main goal of education is to bring about men and women of a certain kind of moral character and wisdom. And that is done universally as a community. This is something that is worked together on as a whole. Imagine what it's like when the common heroes the common mentors and examples are truly great, wise, virtuous human persons. And the community is working together in all ways, culturally, to raise up young unto that image. Imagine what that looks like. Their virtue is being lived in a profoundly communal way. Let's go to a different kind of image. Well, it's not always pretty, but nonetheless is certainly noble, and that is a truly just war. Imagine a situation of a nation that has come together where it is being attacked unjustly, the foundations of its society are under attack, and it comes together and works as one with a communal conviction that the goods that we are seeking to preserve are worth giving up our lives for. And that society works together on all levels. All levels, all ages are working together with a common conviction that for the sake of right and justice, we will live and die together. That's a profoundly beautiful image of the good life, isn't it? So we might bear those in mind when we think real human flourishing is done at a societal level. I go on to number three. A flourishing, well-ordered polis makes for flourishing, happy people. This is an obvious point, but it's really rather important 
the Greeks were absolutely convinced, not that it's impossible to become good if you don't have a supportive good polis or city or nation, but that it is extremely difficult. Uh, and, and, and I'm going to show you a quotation a little later from Plato where he's going to say, when you are in a bad polis, it will only be by a sort of divine dispensation if you really become good. He saw that. So in the, in the natural course of things, it should be the case that we are working together as a broad community, as a nation, to bring about the truly good human life. It is amazing how people will become better people and happy, fulfilling God's will for them, we might say, if society is working towards this as a whole. Who won't if it's not? Number four, Apollos should be judged by two things in particular. What kinds of people rule and what is seen as the human good or the end or the goal in this polis? Basically, Plato would say, you will know all that you need to know about a society if you look at who is ruling in it. Who is ruling? Underneath number four, I put a good ruler, according to Plato, is one who is wise and thus knows the true good of his subjects and works for that true common good. Two things, knowledge and then, as it were, right will in action. You cannot have a good ruler. And this, by the way, applies. It's a good thing about these universal principles. They apply on all levels. And we'll apply this a little later to the family because, in any case, that's something that is much more directly in our power. A good ruler is one who has wisdom on the level of knowledge and then right desire and right action also. So the wisdom of knowing what is the true good of those over whom I rule and how can I bring them to it. That is wisdom. Plato was, may I say, obsessed with the importance of a society needs to have rulers who are wise. If it doesn't, it is in serious trouble. A society needs to have rulers who are wise and, again, who have the character to work consistently for the good, the true good that is understood through the wisdom of the people of that society. So that's one main thing that you can judge a society for, but then also what is seen as the human good at the end of the goal in this poll is, as it were, if you just kind of took a poll, what in general does this society tend to view as the good human life? What does this society as a whole tend to view as the good human life? It's rather easy, I think, ultimately to tell that. You look to its culture. You look to its arts. You look to its entertainment. What is seen as, what is commonly held to be the good human life? For here's the thing. What is commonly held to be the good human life in general will form all new people, as it were, coming along. Subconsciously or consciously, we too, not just new people, we too will tend to think like the society in which we live. One of the challenging things that Plato has made very, very clear to me, we are already thinking with our society in many ways that we're often not aware of. And so what is commonly held to be the good life in a society is a dramatically important issue and something that if we find ourselves in a society that has serious problems, we need to be extremely aware of. I go on to five, which is related. A good polis is one in which there is a common conviction that the good human life 
consists most of all in virtuous living. And those who rule seek through laws to bring about conditions conducive to virtuous living, the true common good. Here's a place that Plato would simply be different than most contemporary political theorists. Laws are not simply about preserving people's rights, keeping people from hurting one another, allowing people to pursue their own individual desires. If we are serious about what the goal of human life is, Plato would say, then the goal of laws is actually to form character. Ultimately, to form a certain kind of character. Laws themselves have as the ultimate goal in view virtuous living. That's a much richer understanding of what political society is ultimately about. Again, point about the stakes are high. The truly good human life requires that much. They would say this, it's not commonly achieved by individuals working on their own. It needs the cooperation of a broader society. I would give the side comment, perhaps in my younger days, I was, I was more tempted to say upon being exposed to thought like that, oh, come on. If you're just kind of strong and buck up, you can become virtuous on your own. You can kind of raise your children well on your own. You don't need the good influence of society. Well, I've been raising children now for a few years, and uh, I wouldn't say what I just said. <laughs> Number six, Apollos decays to the extent that what is held to be the common good is farther away from the true good for man. And correspondingly, those who rule take lower goods as the more important. That we're going to see in a moment when I take you through the outline. If he's going through different regimes, and you're going to see it's a, it's a neat little setup he has of the progressive decay of how a society gets further and further from the right understanding. So we'll come to that in a moment. Seven, start to get a little more specific here, and then we're going to go to the other part of the outline. It is a great evil in a city when persons do not act like true parts of the city. It's a great evil in the city when persons do not act like true parts of the city, true parts of the community. The main example Plato gives, and this will be very challenging, and I also hope very revelatory, the main example is those who see their wealth as serving simply their own private needs and desires. Plato's main example of the decay of society is when people become selfish as regards their wealth. And they see their wealth as fundamentally about simply fulfilling their own desires as opposed to ordered ultimately to our flourishing together. Isn't that a rather dramatic point? We'll come back to that very shortly. Eight, desires or loves not rooted in and given order by, this goes back to my opening point of the evening, desires or loves not rooted in and given order by the love for virtue, are at odds with the true human good. In other words, the true human good, virtue, what is truly first, must be put first and be the principle of all else. If it is not, if we have other desires that are gone rogue, that are just for their own sake, desires for lower things, the main example again is going to be wealth, that isn't rooted in your desire for spiritual goods, for virtue, for communion among persons, then we have a serious principle of disintegration. The love for wealth, when not rooted in and given order by the love of virtue, is the main instance, according to Plato, 
of a love that is corrosive of the city and of the person. I'm going to give you a quotation here. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about wealth as Plato's main central focus in this whole affair. And it, I think it's going to ring true from some things that we've seen going on around us and perhaps will be a good point even for our own self-reflection. Consider the following quotation. From there, they proceed further into money-making. And the more they value it, the less they value virtue. Or aren't virtue or, and wealth so opposed that if they were set on scales, they'd always incline in opposite directions? Now, I already know that right now that's raising lots of questions in your mind, like, isn't that extremist? Come on, wealth isn't evil. I ask you to bear with me for a moment. And let's try to understand what he's saying, because I know already on the other side, there might be a couple of lines from Scripture floating through your mind right now about wealth, where you might find that what Plato said and what the God-man said have a lot in common. That's frankly an uncomfortable topic. But let's just give a little bit of attention here to what Plato is suggesting. Again, I read you those lines. From there they proceed further into money-making, and the more they value it, the less they value virtue. Or aren't virtue and wealth so opposed that if they were set on scales, they'd always incline in opposite directions? What in the world is Plato suggesting? When I raised this in class, I turned that over to the students, and it's just kind of a feeding frenzy of fighting, yelling, screaming, trying to figure out what this might mean. I'm going to, well, it's a little bit of an exaggeration. I wish they were that excited. But anyway, <laughs> let me, you know, for some of them, it's still, when's lunch? But <laughs> Dean Sabatino was yelling and screaming, however, uh, when he was in the classroom. I assure you, and he hasn't stopped, as you've noticed. <laughs> What does Plato mean when he says here, I think the key is in value money-making. From there they proceed into money-making, and the more they value it, the less they value virtue. He doesn't say the more money they have, the less they value virtue. He says the more they value money-making, the less they value virtue. Here's my suggestion, ladies and gentlemen. What does it mean to value money-making? I think what Plato is going after is if you make money-making to be in any way its own end, its own goal, something that is not fundamentally about family life, virtue, higher things. If you turn it loose and in any way just say, yeah, money-making for its own sake, if you do that, that I think is what he means by valuing money-making. And to the extent that we do that, it will work against our valuing virtue. For, may I, I think this is the same principle as you can't have two masters. One or the other must dominate Dominus means master. One another must dominate the other. If the love of virtue doesn't dominate the love of wealth, then they will go in different directions. The love of wealth will be militating against the love of virtue, unless it literally springs forth from it. I mean, that is to be dominated by it. Because... We do need wealth, but consider the approach to wealth when the approach to wealth is, how much wealth do I need for the sake of the true flourishing of my family and the true flourishing of community? Then we go about getting wealth in a very ordered, I dare say, peaceful way. It's not limitless. It doesn't rip our heart away from all those other things that are most important for the very reason we're going to the wealth is for the sake of it serving the higher things because it's a mere instrument 
of what's most important. But if it's not seen as a mere instrument of the deep important things, then it's fighting virtue. And it's pulling the whole society away from the unum necessarium, the one thing necessary that must be the focus. So when it's put on the scale, they go in opposite directions. This, ladies and gentlemen, is why as we look through the different regimes for Plato, the main thing he focuses on is what was that community's approach to wealth? If it sought wealth not for the sake of virtue, then that society was coming apart. And it was just a matter of time before it became completely unhinged. And lower things completely overwhelmed and pushed aside the higher things, which, according to Plato, always will happen. For if what should be ruling is not ruling, then what shouldn't be ruling will be. Always. Always. Remember, desire for wealth is not corrosive and is indeed virtuous when it is precisely rooted in the desire for the seeking of higher things. Let's take a look on our second page here and peek at the first part here is called Features of a Good Constitution. This is all taken just, you know, from a very famous part of Plato's Republic, Book 8 where after having already gone through the features of what a good regime, a good society would look like, he then he, he looks at these other fundamental kinds as a progressive falling away. It, what we might say, does it really necessarily happen in this way? And I think the answer to that is definitely no. It doesn't necessarily, the corruption of the regime doesn't have to look like exactly what he outlines, but the neat thing is the principles. The principles of what he's suggesting brings about the corruption of society. And, and bear in mind, gentlemen, we're not talking about the corruption of government as such. We're talking about the corruption of the whole thing. For the government and the people always go together. In general, a society has leaders, I know it's sometimes an unpleasant thought, but has leaders that match up to the character of the people, by and large. Features of the good constitution. Something that we're not going to spend much time on, but that you have here on the outline, is for every kind of constitutional regime, he says there's a kind of moral character that matches it. So you he, see here in the outline where we say city, and then the man, what the, what the city means is, that, again, that's just translating polis into city, meaning the nation, the political society, and then the man that matches up with it, which is kind of a neat thing. We'll look at it briefly, but not much. A couple of key characters we've already looked at that we can pass over quickly to the top of the page there. The good city, ruled by the wise and virtuous. Parts of the city function well together for the sake of the common good. Material wealth is seen as serving the good of virtue. There is peace and security. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a beautiful thing just to think of, of what such a society would be like. I don't think it's unpatriotic of me to say, I haven't really seen what such a society would be like. I consider myself to be patriotic. I love my country. I'm willing to fight for my country. But I don't think I've seen that. I go on. The constitutions that fall short and then the corresponding individual characters. So here they are. Democracy, oligarchy, democracy, and tyranny. These are a progressive decay. We'll look at this briefly. Beginning with democracy. Tima in Greek means honor. So the good of this city, the first thing that Plato says is, what do people in this city as a whole consider to be the most important thing, the kind of the good, the end, the ordering principle? Bear in mind then, the, the, the key point we saw from the beginning, you will see it play here. As far as he's concerned, once you don't have true virtue, the true good of man, 
being the ordering principle, then the society is coming apart. Each one of these will be progressively worse than the prior one, but the prior one had the seeds of its own destruction because it didn't put first things first. So here in a democracy, what is the good seen as? Honor and victory. Honor and victory in the sense of particularly in a military way. The particular example of that would have been Sparta, if you know a little bit of, of, of Greek history. In, in not a terribly bad society. There was a lot of order. There was a bit of virtue in there. But it was fundamentally ordered around military victory. At the end of the day, that's not putting what is first first. And so the seeds of its own destruction are already therein. Characteristics of so the good is honor and victory, obedience to rulers, harshness to subjects. The way, the way Plato characterizes is leaders possess wealth secretly. The, the, they, they are interested in starting to pursue a certain amount of private wealth. Know that he, he, he slips that in there. That's part of, because they have not put virtue first, this particular manifestation of a moral and political problem has already snuck in. We go on to oligarchy. Oligos in Greek means few, but here the key in an oligarchy, what Plato means by an oligarchy, is it's ruled by the wealthy. Who's ruling the democracy? The generals, basically, are ruling. Who's ruling in an oligarchy? The wealthy. Good is wealth. Plato describes a number of different things that go on here. It becomes a city of rich and poor. The main thing that he, he points out is some men stop working and become drones. One of, his, one of his particularly striking images. Some men in the city become drones, like in the beehive, not truly living as parts of the city. What, what does he mean by that? These, these drones, they're not working. They become drones. What does he particularly mean by that? They're not working for the common good. Here's, here, here's a fascinating assertion. In a society where the wealthy are ruling, what is he particularly saying tends to start to happen there? You will have individuals who will be particularly tempted by their wealth. Other things too, but this is what he folks on. Tempted by their wealth to turn in selfishness towards themselves and not fundamentally see themselves as part of a whole project working towards human flourishing. You start to have the breakdown of society because they see themselves as not responsible for one another, and the main way that that shows up is they are seeking to amass wealth for nothing other than their private interests. What comes next? Democracy. Plato, ladies and gentlemen, let's just be straight to the point, sees Democracy, not as illegitimate, but as problematic. What he calls democracy, which isn't necessarily exactly the same as what we mean by democracy. Nonetheless, I ask you to focus on what he is going after here. The way he characterizes democracy is the main good in that society is freedom. <laughs> Does that ring any bells? What, what probably is the most heard word in political campaigns, but I, I, I digress. The good is freedom, its characteristics, variety, and equality. So the two things that he particularly characterizes democracy by are, this is a society now where, in general, hierarchy is rejected. Nothing is held to be better than another way of life. The key is to allow all individuals to live according to their own private judgment as to what a good life is, because we can't impose upon anybody any objective judgment of what the good life is. And so what do we agree upon? Our goal is to simply give everybody as much freedom as possible and hold everything as equal. There's a lot of things that are attractive about that. What does Plato see therein? Plato sees therein the final step before slavery or tyranny. And let me tell you why. According to Plato, extreme liberty will lead ultimately to slavery. In other words, putting freedom first putting freedom 
and equality first. Just saying, fundamentally, we're not going to impose any ideas of what is good. We're just going to say everybody's judgment should be simply respected, and no one's judgment is necessarily better than anyone else's. This leads ultimately to slavery. Why? Because when you're in the situation of extreme liberty, the lower will overpower the higher. Let's put it this way. Think, about, think of the individual soul. This is what Plato says as illustrating this. If we just claim that every desire that we ever have is equal, so we treat them all as equal, which one will overpower the others? If you pretend that they are all equal, the lower will come to rule. Because again, this is an instance of the principle, if what should be ruling is not ruling, then what should not rule definitely will come to rule. So if I, looked, if I just looked at all the various desires of my own heart and said, you know, all of them are equal, none of them are better than others, which would I follow? The lower ones would come to the fore. They would overpower the higher ones, which are better but take more cultivation and discipline. And I would end up in a situation where I am ruled by the lower. And this is, this is Plato's main critique of democracy. The lowest will end up ruling. If you treat everything as equal, then the lowest will end up in charge. And that, says Plato, is slavery. Why is that slavery? Because slavery is to be subjected to that which is not your own good. Very simple definition of slavery. Slavery is to be subjected to that which is not truly good for you. Slavery is not to be under anyone's, just anyone's authority. Some in democracy would have it sound that to be under anyone's authority is slavery. That's not slavery. Slavery is to be subjected to something that is not your good, says Plato. So this is why we can speak of a slavery to our passions. When your passions rule, you call it slavery. You would never say, I'm, I, I'm a slave of right reason. <laughs> because right reason should rule. To be a slave is to be subjected to what shouldn't be ruling. So that's, that's the example from the soul. When the lower that should not be ruling comes to the fore and rules, we have slavery. You can see that in the individual. You can see that in broader society. So what does he say tends to happen in democracy? Where everybody is treated as equal and all views are treated as none is better than the other. The lower end up ruling and that is slavery because no one will be happy. Because there is only happiness when there is right order and wisdom guides. When wisdom is not guiding, then everything is out of place. When what is not, what should not rule is ruling, then you have unhappiness. That is what he means by slavery. Let me give you a, 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 a quick quotation that's not in your... Um, hand out here, and then I'm just going to give you a few practical implications, and we're done. This, this is where he is referring to what he calls the soul of a man who's like a democracy, the democratic soul. Listen to this. And he doesn't admit any word of truth into the guardhouse. For if someone tells him that some pleasures belong to fine and good desires and others to evil ones, and he must pursue and value the former and restrain and subordinate the latter, he denies all this and declares that all pleasures are equal and must be valued equally. And so he lives on, yielding day by day to the desire at hand. Sometimes he drinks heavily while listening to the flute. At other times, he drinks only water and is on a diet. Sometimes he goes in for physical training. At other times, he's idle and neglects everything. Sometimes he even occupies himself with what he takes to be philosophy. 
He often engages in politics, leaping up from his seat and saying and doing whatever comes into his mind. If he happens to admire soldiers, he's carried in that direction. If money makers in that one, there's neither order nor necessity in his life. But he calls it pleasant, free, and blessedly happy. And he follows it for as long as he lives. Does that sound at all familiar? It's like when the real principle of order is not giving order, we're kind of all over the place. The latest fad is what attracts our attention. For it's all the same anyway. I have a couple other quotations like that, maybe in the question and answer period. We will come back to that. Conclusion on democracy. Insisting that all desires are equal leads to tyranny of the lowest. Very applicable to our own moral life. Very much a matter of concern when looking at the political realm. What can we do in view of these couple few truths we've looked at from Plato? I would suggest to restore order in our political society, ladies and gentlemen. The fundamental truths are those that Plato has given us. We, for instance, must think in terms of the only possibility of restoring order to our political society is to realize that wisdom must be restored. What is wisdom? An understanding of what comes first. We must be willing to stand up and be very clear to the society around us about what the true human good is. May I present for your consideration, we will not be restoring society simply, for instance, to demand that we be left alone or to be asked that we be allowed to have our freedom. If we're going to really counteract what's going on, we must hold that there is a truth that can be known it is a truth that applies not only to us, and this is wisdom. This is the insight as to what the true human life is. And the only way to restore a political society is to try to build a communal understanding that this is human nature, and this is what makes human beings happy. When right reason rules, and the higher desires are put first. Ladies and gentlemen, this, of course, must begin in our individual lives. Here's the good news. What is the main way, I suggest, that the political society will change? Let us look to that which is directly within our hands to change. Putting right order in our own individual lives, putting right order in our families and households, putting right order in our friendships, and putting right order in our small communities. That is what is directly given to us to do. So how might we do that? Let's just think for just a brief moment. Many in this room have authority in a family. Do we approach family life in the household the way that Plato says the true rulers should approach political society? with those two key characteristics, wisdom, knowing what the true end is of family life, right-ordered desires, willing to work in all things to bring about that right understanding, directing all things in our household community to true human flourishing in the sense of the virtuous life. Think about how our household can be a community that is precisely a microcosm of what the city, of what the polis should be. If your and my families are that, that is precisely what will change society. Virtue must be the organizer than other things. And that the virtuous life is precisely what gives that order to everything that we do. Again, we can show that by precisely what we do in our own families. And I'm going to hold a couple of other comments about education and communal cultural customs until the question and answer period. Thank you very much.
Dr. Cutterback, I don't know if you've been asked this before, but how much of the founders understood these ideas, or did they get it wrong from the get-go, or have we been corrupted and been misled by nefarious people throughout, over the past hundred years or so? I, that, that, so I don't need to repeat the question. Um, th that is a great question. It is a very important question. It is a very controversial question. And watch me pass the ball on this one. Uh, honestly, I don't know the founders well enough to answer that question. That, that is not my area. I have spent a lot more time reading Plato than I have reading the founders. I, I will tell you that my inclination is in the direction of the seeds of the problem were there from the start. There definitely has been a decay, though. I mean, so, so in a sense, I think it's, it's, it's both. We absolutely have decayed. But there were certain principles that our founders took from, I'd say, the good tradition that goes back to what we're talking about, but there were also certain principles that they took from certain European thinkers that were already rejecting it. And, and so the, I say, there, was a, there was a kind of contradiction, a, a, a little bit of, a, a, of, I would suggest, a sub obsession with freedom that, that was already problematic. So thank you for the question. That deserves a, a, a closer look. Uh, but while the deacon is walking, I would just say, I don't think our best approach would be just, let's go back to our own founding to get things straight. I think we have a richer tradition yet. We don't have to reject the founding, but we have a ri richer tradition yet that we can go to that we need not be restricted to. Let's just go back to our founding. I think we have more to offer than that. In the past, say, maybe 50 to 100 years, what happened to our Catholic Church? Was it the unraveling of the family that was separate from our community churches that began to self-corrupt? Um, uh, this is a, another very important and very difficult question. So, so of course, to so say what happened to the... Uh, um, to the church, I mean, let, let me, in a sense, you are asking about the mystery of evil. I, I mean, there, there has been, um, I mean, historically, there's a number of different ways we can address it. Historically, there's been, I'd say, most looking honestly at the situation, is that while there's been many great graces, the, the very pontiffs of the last century have been talking about a kind of attack that's been the fruits of certain currents that have been going on for some time in modern civilization. Um, and it has progressively chipped away at, uh, at, at family life and affected many that were inside the church that has led to great problems inside the church. Of course, we know the gates of hell shall not prevail. So, I mean, I'd, in a word, what's happened? We have lost the moral character that we should have. <laughs> I mean, that's what has happened. The answer is always to once again restore proper order and put first things first. If I might, I might just say, I, this is what I love about Plato and Aristotle, where they are so right. So much comes down to real authority. And I, particularly as a man and thinking about my own role in my family, I, I like to think when I'm tempted to complain about society and about government, I should ask myself, am I exercising authority well in my family, in my own life, in my family? And I must start there. So I like to, I'd like to turn it towards we are failing morally. And the only way to turn around, by the grace of God, is to reestablish right ruling, that wisdom order things well. Ayn Rand, a rather um, influential political thinker for today, at least in conservative circles, would put wealth uh, or the, the pursuit of wealth, wealth selfishly as, you know, in the forefront. How would Plato respond to Ayn Rand and her philosophy? 
Well, I don't know Ayn Rand uh, well, but um, I might say, I mean, fu fundamentally, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to sound a little bit like a broken record, so I'm going to ask your for forgiveness for that. But I'm going to say he, he would point to common human experience and what we can see is the flourishing happy person. And, and, and the great paradox, that again, these great thinkers are so aware of, is these other ways of life are very attractive to us. But ultimately, they never satisfy only right character where you've put virtue first uh, satisfies. And the great thing is that this is what they hammer at. And to me, it, it's everything. Again, allow me to say, you put the spiritual goods, you put virtue first. Not only do you then get that, you get everything else too because everything in is, is in its place. You actually can appreciate wealth. I, I, I give you the, the poor family or even a poor community that puts first things first, they have festivals like you and I only dream of. They know how to enjoy things. And it's just common human experience shows putting first things first makes for happiness from top to bottom. But putting wealth first always leads to a, a showy fizzle and disintegration, atomization, and destruction. I think, I think Plato would say something like that and say, the choice is yours. But you put selfishness and money first, you're going to lose everything. Everything. And that's at the heart of understanding individual life and, so and society. Society will lose everything, too. Hi. Hi. Um, people who are in favor of abortion, politicians I'm talking about, will go on, wax eloquently, about social justice. So, and in one way, I think they're trying to appeal as the virtuous side. But, of course, you know, the killing of the unborn. I mean, what, what's going on there? How do you, how do you approach that? Have, have they kind of taken over part of the rhetoric or something that's confusing people? You have a great, great question. That is, that, is, that is a perversion, the profundity of which is hard to express. The profound perversion of language that is involved in, in speaking of justice when you, are, when you are allowing the most fundamental injustice. I, I mean, this, I mean, th this is, um, of course, the issue of our day in many ways. And I would just say, we have to be ready, I would recommend, based on these principles, to be more radical. We have to be prepared to take a stand in the name of justice and, and, and say, this absolutely cannot stand and be prepared to take stronger steps to be able to say, for the sake of restoring justice, for the common good, for the good of these others, those that are losing their lives, innocently. I mean, it's so dramatic. I'm not, I'm not sure what to say at the moment. because that, uh, um, Great question. Perversion of the deepest order and requires extremely strong response. What? It's hard to say. Please. In, the, in his discussion of the sort of decay that's inherent in these different forms of government, he mentions that philosophy tempered with music is the only savior of his virtue throughout life. I was wondering if you could address what is it about the music that he, because he keeps coming back to that. Is there something about music that is? Uh, well, or is I didn't like, pay her to, oh, to ask man, that question. I mean, <laughs> no, really. <laughs> Um, can, I, can I take you home and, and have you be in my classes and ask good questions like that? Um, all right. F first of all, I don't know, do you have, Deacon, do you have it back there, the lecture that I gave on music? Um, I get more soon out. I get more emails about the lecture I gave on music a year ago here than I get about any other lecture I've ever given. 
So there, there was a lecture I gave on music that he has somewhere, and it came with a bunch of quotations from Plato and, and, and Aristotle. Um, but, I mean, real quick, on, on page three, um, this, the beautiful thing that I wanted to give you here was Plato's insight of the importance of good customs that will never be of law. Law is not the only thing that's important in a society, though it's absolutely central, but it's critically important that we have good customs. So uh, I'm just going to say... What's in music? Music is profoundly moral. It, uh, it, it affects us. It's expressive of so much that's in us. It affects how we think, feel, and act. And I just give that to you as a teaser, and he gives many examples thereof. May I just, in this context, read out loud, just because I just think it's so powerful, given where we are now, when... Uh, I'm, I'm reading on page three. But when children play the right games from the beginning, absorb lawfulness from music and poetry, it follows them in everything and fosters their growth, correcting anything in the city that may have gone wrong before. Isn't that dramatic? In other words, the very opposite of what happens where games are lawless. These people will also discover the seemingly insignificant conventions their predecessors have destroyed. Talk about something my generation. The seemingly insignificant conventions, customs, always key in any civilization. Well, it's customs, not of law, but at what was commonly held, you do do this and you don't do that, by custom. Things like this, says Plato. When it is proper for the young to be silent in front of their elders, when they should make way for them or stand up in their presence, the care of parents, the care of parents, hairstyles, clothes, shoes to wear. Don't hairstyles say something? Oh, yeah. They can say something. Deportment and everything else of that sort. He goes on, I think it's foolish to legislate about such things. You can't make a law about hairstyles. But it makes a difference what hairstyles people have. If you have a young lady that has a buzz cut that's green. <laughs> so I'm not trying to offend anybody, but that says something about life. It says something. It means something to people. Many people might do that innocently. I'm not accusing that person, but we're just saying these things matter. We must not be judgmental of them, but rather as, I mean, I think of our Lord seeing such a person. Our Lord would have gone to that person like a magnet because he's saying, that person's yelling, she, she needs me, right? So we go to such people with love. All, all I'm saying is, the, these things are in a, all a part of how a civilization must cultivate virtue in its music, in its arts, in its things as simple as our customs of do we stand up? In the, in the presence of the elder. So all those things have a, have a greater importance. And in, in any case, Plato's trying to say to us, don't forget these things. In, in putting what's first first, that will actually give the proper importance to everything else. It's a whole package deal. Let's work on the whole thing all together. Thank you for your question, and, and I wish I could say more specifically about that. Thank you very much, Dr. Cutterback. Thank you.